get ready to take off on a one-of-a-kind adventure. You've never been on a journey like this or travel to a country the way we're going to take you. It's a land with a mysterious, mystical past. And if you think you know this place, prepare to be surprised. With incredible natural wonders and a vibrant mix of color, culture, and music. And on this trip, we're going to soar through the sky, zip through the rainforest, and dive into secret caverns. We'll sing with the whales and explore the hidden treasures of a vanished culture. And our guide for this special journey is a man uniquely qualified to lead us on a tour of his country. He was born here and has traveled through the entire length and width of its vast expanse. He is a man who has climbed to the top, a man leading his country through the challenges of a singular time in its history. His name, Felipe Calderon, and he is the president of Mexico. And for the next hour, he's going to take us places most travelers have never seen. This is Mexico, the Royal Tour. Bordered to the north by the United States and to the south by Guatemala and Belize, Mexico is one of the most geographically diverse countries in the world. It boasts nearly 6,000 miles of coastline, the Sierra Madre mountain ranges, Sonoran deserts, remote islands, and lush rainforests. At the heart of this country of 111 million people is its capital, Mexico City. I'm Peter Greenberg, and Mexico City is where I began my tour. The president had invited me to meet him at Los Pinos, the official residence and office of the head of state. Los Pinos, or the Pines, is nestled inside Chapultepec Park at the center of Mexico's federal district. was an impressive greeting. Perhaps even more impressive, the president had cleared his schedule to take me on a five-day, intense, non-stop adventure throughout Mexico. Thank you. Mr. President. Hello, Peter. A pleasure to receive you here. And thank you for having me in Mexico. Welcome. I'm looking forward to our journey. This is quite an impressive building. Yes. These days, no visit to Mexico can avoid a serious conversation about the current state of affairs. In the past, it might just have been about immigration issues. Today, it's about the deaths of tens of thousands of Mexicans in a tragic war between drug cartels. And that war has become topic A. So we sat down in President Calderon's library for a frank discussion. Well, I've been coming to Mexico since I'm 21 years old, mm. and I still only know this much about it. And yet, so many of my own friends have a perception of Mexico as just being a dusty border town, people wearing sombreros, all these terrible stereotypes. And even when I came down here to see you, what were the two words they told me? Be careful. Oh, yeah. Right? Not a surprise to you to hear that. No, not a surprise, unfortunately. We need to change the perception about Mexico outside. But it is not an easy perception to overcome. This is the Mexico most foreigners see on television. It started when drug cartels declared war on each other. Then Calderon decided to tackle the organized crime problem head on. Now many say they're afraid to go to Mexico. But let me tell you that the problem of violence is more related with the battle between the one gang to another is drug trafficking related. It's not related with tourists, for instance, and that is very important. But for somebody watching this show, what can you do to assure them that 
and specifically, if you can, what you're doing to fix that, because the perception still exists, as you know. Yes, well, two years ago, the Attorney General Office published a list of the 37 most wanted. We have ceased, or there are out of business, 20 out of those 37, so more than a half. While exceedingly few Americans have died at the hands of the drug cartels, the fatality numbers among Mexicans remain shocking. And the president believes that the U.S. must shoulder some of that responsibility. Uh, let me say this in this way. I live in an apartment, and my neighbor is the largest consumer of drugs in the world. And everyone tried to sell him drugs through my window, through my door, so it is difficult to live in this building with this kind of neighbor. Not only do Americans buy billions of dollars of illegal drugs from the Mexican cartels each year, Americans also sell the weapons that the cartels use. We seized more than 90,000 guns and weapons, 50,000 or those are assault weapons, and 90% of those assault weapons are sold in the United States, so. And then come across the border. And then come across the border. The Calderon government has enjoyed unprecedented cooperation and intelligence sharing with the Obama administration. And together, they've made great strides in combating the cartels. And much of that success is due to this. A new, underground, highly classified, high-tech intelligence bunker in the center of Mexico City, where the entire country is put on a grid and monitored 24-7 by 1,800 agents. I can tell you, Peter, that Mexico has the state of the art in terms of technology fighting criminals. You got the idea for that almost from a television show. Well, I was telling some advisors what exactly I wanted in order to improve our effort fighting organized crime. And it was very difficult to me to explain what I needed. I told, have you ever seen this TV show 24 with Jack Bauer and so on? Well, I want all the instruments of this guy. You want all the toys? Yes. Well, all the instruments, and I got it. It's effective, let me tell you. It is a battle Calderon is committed to continue, a fight to rid his country of the violence caused by the drug gangs, and at the same time, to repair the social fabric of his people, and to change the perceptions of his country by the outside world. One common misconception is about the size of Mexico. Many believe the drug violence is widespread. But in fact, the drug wars are concentrated mostly in very specific northern parts of what is an enormous country. I'm amazed at how big your country really is. Yes, it's really big. So could you imagine that between Tijuana and Cancun, it's is like the distance between Washington, D.C. and Las Vegas, for instance? It's a big country. We're about to cover a lot of ground, aren't we? A lot of ground, yes. So what do you have planned for me? A lot of surprises, you will see. As we lifted off from Los Pinos, we were joined by the First Lady, Margarita Zavala. She's the only First Lady in Mexican history to have served two terms in Congress. Our first stop on the royal tour, the state of Chiapas in the southern part of the country. Although his battles against the drug cartels gets the most media attention, the president actually thinks the biggest challenge for his country in the 21st century is climate change. The traditional conception is that it's endless land, endless not. forest, and that is not. It only took a glance out the window to see a large section of jungle already carved up into farmland. It's a very poor soil for agricultural purposes. I mean, the world is losing the jungle or the forest. So we are trying to switch the use of the land again. Some have called the president a climate guru, and perhaps with good reason. Since 2007, the Calderon government has responded to the threat by planting 250 million trees a year and by creating a policy for sustainable forest management. The president then stunned the world by announcing that by 2050, Mexico would cut its greenhouse gas emissions by 50%. And Mexico's already on track to reach that goal, far outpacing more developed countries. Peter, 
we are landing at the jungles of Chiapas. It's a perfect place for a first stop on the royal tour because this spot will actually involve royalty. Peter, this is the marvelous city of Palenque. A lot of archaeologists say that Palenque is the most sublime city of the Mayan civilization. By the 8th century AD, Palenque covered about 50 square miles. Today, thousands of structures remain covered by jungle. It's believed that only 10% of the city has been explored. But there was one part of Palenque that the president really wanted to show me. The Temple of the Inscriptions. This grand pyramid has jealously guarded a secret for well over a thousand years. And now, the president wanted to share that secret with me. But as we reached the top, I was struck by an otherworldly sound. Mr. President, what's, what's that growling noise? Those are the monkeys, because we are in the middle of the jungle. Wow, so this is the secret you told me about? Oh, no, absolutely not. Let me show you the secret. And what better way to a secret than a secret passage? Let me tell you that this stair was hidden during centuries. This stairway remained blocked for almost 1,400 years wow. until 1950, when Mexican archaeologist Alberto Ruz removed a stone slab, which then revealed the path to an amazing discovery. OK, come on, Peter. We are almost, almost there. Look at this chamber. Wow. Come on in, Peter. Laid out in front of us was an ornately carved stone. It's big. It's really big. So you can imagine it weighs like 14,000 pounds. Seven tons. Carved into this giant stone is a depiction of a Mayan king being lowered into the jaws of the underworld, the frightening place the Mayans believe their souls went after death. And when archaeologists removed the stone slab, they found this jade death mask and the skeletal remains of the once mighty King Pakal staring back at them. Until that moment, historians had no idea that like the Egyptians, the Mayans also entombed their rulers. They believed that the temples were only for worship. But finally, after this discovery, all the perceptions and all the knowledge about Mayans changed radically. So this is the secret. This is the secret. The secret of the tomb. The secret of the temple of inscriptions. But Palenque still held an even bigger mystery. By the year 900, the city was abandoned. And where'd the Mayans go? Well, let me show you. Why the great Mayan cities were abruptly abandoned remains one of the great mysteries of archaeology. Was it warfare, overpopulation, disease, or drought? Scholars can only speculate. But what the president was about to show me is that the Maya are still around. As we landed in the nearby village of Metzabak, it was immediately clear that the faces of these Lacandona people were the same as the ones inscribed on Pakal's tomb 1,400 years ago. Peter, here on the river, we can learn more about the ancestors of the Lacandones. Bueno, acá son varios. Hay otro nombre aquí, tienen nombre puro, están en el Maya. Están en Maya. Oh, okay. Están en Maya. Oh, okay. 
Of course. You know, they are all descendants of the Maya. All descendants of the Maya, of course. Yes, and they are the owners of this beautiful place. The Mayans fled the invading Spaniards, and for five centuries, the Lacandonas have lived here in rural isolation, clinging to their traditional ways. But now things are beginning to change. Very recently, we signed an agreement between the government and them. We are paying the members of the community in order to preserve the rainforest. So they don't cut it down? They don't cut it down, any single tree. So rather than slashing the rainforest to create farmland, the Lacandonas are instead beginning to support themselves with ecotourism. <laughs> ah. How deep is the water? Huh? You ever see? Okay. I'm going to run a little bit. Ah. Paddle bit. OK, I'm going to do it. OK? Yeah, sure. Now we're having fun. Ahora, ¿no? ¿me puedes platicar? ¿Nos podemos acercar y me platicas sí. qué, qué figuras hay ahí? We stopped at a cliff wall covered in prehistoric paintings. Painted, they say, with human blood. The hand there. Yes, the hand, the little face. The, that is some kind of devil. And that is a monkey. Can you see? Oh, yeah, sure. Left. The blood is from a single person. Uh, so who is married is not possible to receive his blood. Only single person. Why are you looking at me? Hmm? You're single. <laughs> so you're the, the perfect candidate. <laughs> Luckily for me, we paddled on. So we are going to the cave, which is that way. Those bats? They just flew by. The cave is the path to the other world. Oh, wow. To pop a hole and chuck off with you. There is a skull there. Ah, yeah. Ah, yeah, Louis. You know, must I keep it? Oof. A lot of skulls. Around. The Lacandonas had no doctor at all. So somebody got sick? Yes, they used to come here, pray, bring some kind of offers in honor of the God in order to cure the people who is sick. So somebody didn't do too well. Yeah, all right. <laughs> OK, we can go back. Have we angered the gods? <laughs> Probably they are happy. When we reached the choppers, they were already running and ready for takeoff. When you travel with the president, you better move fast. Now we are going to follow the rainforest northeast to the Yucatan. Out the window, I was greeted by a spectacular view of the legendary ruins of Chichen Itza. We are in Chichen, which is the sacred city of the Mayans and the most important place of the Mayan civilization. But you can see the pyramid. Chichen Itza is the most important place of the Mayan civilization and the best preserved site. The Temple of Kukul Khan is the world famous symbol of Chichen Itza. It was recently voted one of the new seven wonders of the world. But the secret wonder of Chichen Itza lies here in the Caracol, the ancient Mayan observatory. The Mayans were tremendous astronomers. They were able to predict the orbits of Venus and even to predict eclipses and comets. And they were able to build these marvelous sites. Each site at Chichen Itza is connected by an astronomical link. On the spring and fall equinoxes, the temple creates shadows that lead to stone serpent heads at the base and that creates the illusion of a giant snake descending from the temple. Even the number of steps has an astronomical significance. The president told me that each of the four sides has 91 steps. Add in the top platform and you get 365, the number of days in the solar calendar. And you know this to be 91 steps. 91 steps. Do you want to count? Let's go. OK. All right. Come on. 
So we need to climb. Right. Sideways. Sideways. Like a serpent. Like a and serpent. That is the reason why the Mayans made this, the steps in this way, because they must to climb like a serpent. <laughs> 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31. I'll go this way now. Two, 33. What so. number are we on now? <laughs> 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 90, 91. Okay. We did it. He's right. It's 91 steps. And his heart is in good condition. Now my question to you, sir, is <laughs> yes, we got to go down. Later. Later, okay. yeah, later. Up at the top, the president had even more to show me. So you can see all the surface of the peninsula from here. Wow. Very and it wasn't just the spectacular bird's eye view of the jungle. It was when we reached the entrance to the pyramid. The most incredible thing about Kukulkan is that this one pyramid is actually two. In a show of wealth and power, Mayan culture sometimes built larger pyramids atop older ones and the outer pyramid has kept secret treasures hidden from view for hundreds of years. So this is a very special place, and it's, it's not easy to get into, but uh, we have special permission. We headed into the depths of the outer structure until we reached the top of the wow. older pyramid inside. I have a surprise for you. The jaguar, the wow. jaguar of the Mayans used to be reserved for the king. You can imagine the king seated on the throne of the Jaguar in front of all the land in the top of the pyramid. Because this used to be outside. Yes. Yes, of course. And that's all jade, isn't it? It's all jade. Amazing. OK. Now we go down. Time to go back. OK. Yes. We have a lot of things to see here in Chichen Itza. Things to see. And as I was about to find out, listen the echo. Things to hear. Did you listen to that? Yeah. The sound of the bird. Which bird? The most important bird of this area is Quetzal. The Quetzal bird is one of the most revered species in Mayan tradition. And Mayan engineers and architects used advanced acoustical designs to recreate the sound of this sacred bird. Can I try? Yes. Wow. Oh, yes. And... Oh, you hear it on all the sides now? Yes. Not a coincidence. Not a coincidence. Mayan design not only revered life, but death as well. And just a short distance from the ruins lay the Chichen's portal to the underworld. To appease the rain god, Chichen priests sacrificed humans, gold, and jade into sacred sinkholes called cenotes. They were believed to be the residence of the lords of death. The president wanted to take me in for a closer look at one of these cenotes and the mysterious Mayan underworld. This is the cenote. And there are hundreds of them in Yucatan. Today, we are not sacrificing young ladies. We sacrifice journalists. Wait, Where is your wetsuit? That was good. <laughs> you are kidding, aren't you? But seriously, since the Yucatan has virtually no rivers, the only reliable source for drinking water were these freshwater cenotes. So it's no accident that the Mayans always built their settlements nearby. This one, Cenote Dos Ojos, is one of the many entrances to an underground river system that's 42 miles long. And the president wanted a closer look. Every time I come here to dive, it amazes me how beautiful it is. One of the problems divers have is that they become seduced by the beauty around them and spend twice as much time down here as they plan. Anybody with a scuba license and enough nerve can do this dive, but you'll probably want to go with a guide because there are places in this dark labyrinth where it's easy to become disoriented or lost. And yes, past divers have found ancient Mayan skeletons in some of these cenotes, with injuries that suggest human sacrifice. 
By now, it was obvious that the president was fascinated with Mayan culture. But he still had another thing to show me. As we left the Yucatan, the president pointed out a lone green mountain rising out of the jungle. But as we circled, the mountain soon revealed the mighty pyramid of Kalakmu, a structure that predates Chichen Itza by a thousand years. It's like the jungle wants to swallow it. Archaeologists have only recently begun the painstaking task of revealing the remains of this once Mayan superpower from the dense jungle below. And we've got the photos to prove it. Well, that is, if you're Facebook friends with the First Lady. We left the jungles behind and headed northwest to the state of Jalisco. Our destination, the coastal city of Puerto Vallarta. There are a lot of Mexican traditions performing here. I want to show you a special one. Oh my goodness, what are those guys doing? The name of this is the Voladores de Papantla, the Flyers of Papantla. Their name hinted at what was to come, but I never imagined what I was about to see. Oh wow, look at this. It has not any security measure. Are you dizzy? I'm dizzy. Yeah. <laughs> Legend has it that the ritual of the flyers of Papantla began 450 years ago to appease the gods during a long drought. Today, their descendants are practically born into the tradition, beginning their training at just six years of age. There are five persons. One is the caporal. Right. Basically, he represented the sun and the other four represent four elements, earth, water, wind, and fire. Each one of them is going to fly 13 revolutions around the stick. 13 revolutions times four. 52. 52, which means the weeks of the year. Is it any different than the pyramids with the steps that's, at the top? the same, same, same issue. So every thing. number has a reason. Every number has a reason for that. That was great, but we're not doing that. Uh, no. No. I think the next time. The president promised that this next stop on the royal tour would really be an adventure. And we had on board some very special guests. The president's three children, Juan Pablo, Luis Felipe, and Maria. More stairs, Mr. President? Uh, a little bit. Very good for your health, actually. <laughs> Do you know, Peter, the best way to see the forest isn't from the ground. It from the tree tops. So who is first, Peter? I think you are, Mr. President. Oh, uh, uh, really? Yeah. Uh, be my guest here. No, no, you're going first. I want to learn from you. All right. Muy bien. Okay. Listo, ahora puedo tomar asiento. Ya, me voy, okay. Okay, goodbye, Pete. I hope you enjoy Mexico. Hmm? Uh, are you saying goodbye? Sí, cuando guste. I had to admit, the president made that look pretty easy. So now, it was my turn. Bye-bye. Whoa! Whoa! Perfect. Right on, my friend. That was an experience, boys. <laughs> and if you're wondering if ziplining is for kids, just ask Luis Felipe. Maria. Juan Pablo. As we made our way from one canopy to the next, the thrills of riding the lines gave way to just appreciating the beauty of the environment. You see, Peter, I told you, the best way to see the rainforest 
is from the treetops. Beautiful. I, I like it so much. I'm glad to hear that. If you don't survive, can I have it? Uh, sure. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm ready. Let's do it. Adios, amigo. Un gusto conocerte. Bye-bye. The royal tour was off again, this time following the coast south to the region of Michoacan. Our destination, the wooded beauty of the forest. I'm liking this. You can't beat the scenery. It's amazing. Where we were headed, the president promised, was going to be unlike anything I'd ever seen. We hitched up the horses and continued on foot. We are going into the deeper part of this wood. We were headed to the Mariposa Biosphere Reserve. Oh, those are the butterflies. High up in the treetops, monarch butterflies literally filled the sky. That's all butterflies? Yes. I, oh, I see them all up there. Yes, thousand of them. There are so many butterflies that if you listen carefully, you can hear their wings beating. Wow, they're everywhere. Now there are more of them. Look, look how many more. Yes. What is even more amazing is the story behind how these butterflies get to this forest. The butterflies travel 2,800 miles from Canada and part of the United States to this place. The monarch is the only butterfly that migrates south for the winter, like a bird. They're snowbirds. They're snowbirds, snow birds, more or less, yes. Yeah. Some scientists say the butterfly could fly more than 50 miles a day, even more than 100 miles. Yet what's truly amazing is that with a lifespan of only a few weeks to a few months, it's only every fourth generation of butterfly that instinctively knows when and where to make that long trip south. The generation living in winter, they realize that they need to do all this way south towards Mexico, so they always arrive this very same place. So they were the original tourists? Yes, 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 yes. How they pass the survival information on across generations remains a mystery. It's magical how they get here, it's magical what they do here, and yes. it's still unexplained how they come back here every single every year. Every single year. Mr. President, yeah? you, have, you have two new friends. Oh, uh, yes? yes, I can see that. Wow. Yeah. We took off to a spectacular sunset. As we came in for a landing, the president told me he was taking me on a tour of one of his favorite cities, Morelia. We arrived a bit late for sightseeing, so he offered to take me somewhere else instead. A place so exclusive, so private, so inside, a place that few outside his inner circle ever get to see. His mom's house. Hola. The president was born here in Morelia into a Catholic working class family, the youngest of five children. I'm actually Peter Greenberg here. I'm doing a, uh, actually, I'm visiting Mexico with an amazing. In Spanish, por favor. <laughs> <laughs> I have a great translator. Ah, thank you so much. But the president isn't the only Calderon success story. With an anthropologist, doctor, accountant, and engineer in the family as well, it's clear where the family fortune went, to education. Was he a good student? Is it a good student or no? Did you ever think he would end up running the country? No. She said that I used to say since child that I'm going to be president. I can't remember either. <laughs> huh? I can't remember. So you can see, this is Mari Carmen. Uh huh. This is John. Let me guess, who's that? That is me. Young Felipe became laser focused on politics from a very early age. He followed in the footsteps of his father, Luis Calderon Vega, who spent his own life fighting against an authoritarian government in Mexico and who, 
in 1939, co-founded the president's own political party, the PAN. At age 25, Calderon won his first local election and soon burst onto the national scene by winning a seat in the Chamber of Deputies, where he met his wife, Congresswoman Margarita Zavala. After a bid for the governorship in his home state of Michoacan, Calderon became the national president of the PAN party and was instrumental in helping Vicente Fox become the first real democratically elected Mexican president in modern times. In 2005, Calderon began his own bid for the presidency. He began far behind in the polls, but when the ballots were cast, he won the controversial election by less than 1% of the vote, and at age 44, became one of the youngest presidents in Mexican history. It was an honor his father, unfortunately, did not live to see. Well, this is the official picture, isn't it? Oh, yes. yes. This is my son. What, what's his name? Felipe. Yeah. Oh, oh, I remember now. OK. <laughs> it was time to head out. We had another early start tomorrow. Lovely to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. One more. Una más. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Mr. President. See you tomorrow. You got it. The next morning, the president was eager to show me around his hometown of Morelia, and his pride is understandable. The Spanish first established a settlement here in 1541, and the city still has a colonial European feel. In fact, Morelia has so jealously preserved its architecture that in 1991, UNESCO declared the city a World Heritage Site. Look at the sky. Yes. Beautiful. We met up under the bell towers of the cathedral. These have built by the 17th, 18th century, and it takes more than 100 years to be built. They are beautiful, huh? It's yeah. a beautiful sound. I remember that very well. It's very emotional, very emotional, because I know that I belong to this place. I belong to this city. But there was one place the president really wanted to visit, and it was on the other side of town. Peter, this is where I went to secondary school. Mr. President? Hello, how are you? And the students there were in for quite a surprise. He seemed more like a visiting rock star than a visiting head of state. It's a pleasure to meet me, and I'm doing so well for the country. Ah. Thank gracias. And when the president asked if they wanted a photo with him, <laughs> well. And with that, we made a hasty retreat, leaving these kids with a story they'll tell to their children about the day the president came to school. Now we are headed northwest. Next, I'm taking you to the lagoons of the world-famous Baja California. We hit the open water. Our destination, the lagoon at Ojo de Liebre. Every year, thousands of gray whales make an incredible journey to reach this spot. It's the longest migration of mammals in the world. They come from Alaska and the North Pole to this place. It's probably 14,000 miles. They are swimming like 24 hours a day. Each year, the whales make these lagoons their winter home, making it a spot for whale watching unlike any other in the world. Oh, ballena, oh, 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 oh. ballena, ballena. Oh, oh, wow. oh, there's one right over there. There's one right over there. Wow! wow. Did you see that? Look at that, look at that. Whoa! Oh. 
This animal could be 50 feet long. There he is. Hola, oh. ballenita. Can could weigh probably 30 tons. That's big. That's big, yes. Oh! Yeah. yeah. That was cool. It was the most whales I had ever seen, but they still seemed to be keeping their distance. The president, however, had an idea. There is a theory that the voice of children singing helps to attract the whales. Well, as luck would have it, we just happened to have some children with us. Canten, niños, canten, canten. And what do you know? It didn't take long. It was a magical moment, a communion between children and nature. The whales approached for a closer look, taking obvious care to be gentle near the boat. Wow! <laughs> the water in these lagoons has an unusually high salt content, and that gives the whales buoyancy. It makes it easier for them to mate. The salinity also helps keep baby whales afloat while they learn to swim, and at the same time, it keeps sharks away. It all adds up to make these lagoons a whale's perfect winter destination. In peak season, as many as 1,500 adult whales return here to the waters of their birth and breed up to 800 babies, which means all these whales are actually Mexicans. They come back every single year. They have no papers, <laughs> but they can go north and come back every year. Got it! I said it! <laughs> <laughs> Why these whales bring their young to interact with humans is a mystery, even to scientists. Oh, Some say it's simple curiosity, but others see a more personal connection. This is nothing scientific, but uh, th these are very emotional animals. The whales like the voice of the kids, the sound of the kids, or the spirit of the kids. What about the voice of the president singing? Well, <laughs> I think that they don't care about the voice of the president. <laughs> They're very rational. Hola, hola, hola. Hola, hola, hola. See, I saw you touch the whale. Oh, well, that's the Mexican hospitality. <laughs> huh? Adios, ballenas. Adios, ballenas. Adios, ballenas. Oh, cool. <laughs> We left the coast behind and headed back inland. At our next stop, the president told me we'd be doing some spelunking. But this cave was going to be unlike any other I'd ever explored. Come on and see. Here it is. Pit caves like these dot the Mexican landscape, but the Sotono de las Golondrinas, or Cave of Swallows, is one of the deepest of all. It's nearly a quarter of a mile to the bottom and cavernous enough to hold New York's Chrysler Building. So let me see if I get this straight. We're going all the way to the bottom? Yeah. Are you ready? No. <laughs> Listos? Peter, don't worry. This is all perfectly safe. Somehow, that didn't make me feel any better. Good luck, my friend. It has been a pleasure to meet you. You are a sadist. My goodness. <laughs> Mr. President, was this your idea? But you wanted to know Mexico better. This is the deep Mexico, Peter. Moments later, the president began his descent. Well, look who it is. Hi, Peter. Let's go, my friend. Viva Mexico. Papa! Wow, wow. 
It was slow going. One of the dangers of rappelling from this height is that the rope can heat up to dangerous levels and snap. And if you fall, well, from the top, you'd free fall for 12 seconds before impact. Think about that. I know I was. This is pretty amazing. You scared? No. No. I'll actually, I'm enjoying. Good. Huh? Good. Well, you're the president. Yeah. But that is, I have other duties that are more difficult and more dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Mr. President, I have to tell you, if we get all the way down to the bottom here, and uh, there's a Starbucks here, I'm going to be very disappointed. <laughs> right. Prepare for landing. Fasten your seatbelt, Peter. Whoa. Oh, all right. man. All right, where's Mr. President? OK, he's coming He's on. coming down. OK, OK, OK. OK, Peter. Well done, my friend. Ya llegué, Juan Pablo. And after hearing his son call down, the president decided to record a message for his kids. Suelo, aquí estamos a 370 metros sobre el nivel del mar. Say hello, Peter. Mr. President, we made it. Okay. Traten de disfrutar lo mejor de la vida siempre y que sean muy felices. I'm telling my kids that. They need to enjoy the best of the life always. Gracias a todos, niños. Viva México. Oh, I want to see. We didn't have long to stay. We took a quick tour of the pit bottom. I was amazed at the size. It was larger than three football fields down there. Okay. What are all these? Oh, <laughs> glasses, watches. Probably. So welcome to the lost and found. <laughs> But there was one stop the president had to make before we headed back up, the visitor's guest book. I'm very proud about the wonderful country we have. We must to fight in order to preserve Mexico for always, to preserve it clean, fair, democratic, safe, free, and prosper. So Felipe Calderón, president of Mexico. OK, ready. Listo. Oh, you see, the swallows are coming, so we must go, Peter. I know. Let's go. <coughs> OK. All right, Mr. President. Hey, Peter. Eh? I'll see you at the top. I'll see you at the top. We lifted off again and returned to the state of Jalisco. Below us lay a breathtaking expanse of Mexican farmland and the president insisted that there was only one proper way to experience this terrain. You know, Peter, you look good on the horse. You think so? Yes, I do. Whoa! <laughs> and now we are arriving to the town of Tequila. Tequila? Yes. Do you have any idea why we are here? I hear the word tequila, so I'm getting a pretty good idea. The city of Tequila was founded in 1530 by Franciscan monks, but the city is most famous for the drink that bears its name. In 1758, farmer Jose Cuervo purchased land in this region and began producing the liquor known as tequila. Today, six generations later, his descendants still run the business that's made this town famous. And what is it that's made tequila the lifeblood of this region? Well, it all has to do with the area's red volcanic soil soil that's particularly well suited to one plant, the blue agave. The agave has made tequila synonymous with Mexico and a source of Mexican identity and pride. The tequila is only Mexican, and it is only from this place, only from this region. Just like champagne in France. Exactly. I am going to get a chance to drink it, though. Uh, I hope so, yes. <laughs> there is my family. Ah, hi, guys. Hello, kids. With Margarita and the kids in tow, the president took us in for a closer look. The secret of tequila, he explained, lies beneath the leaves. OK, do you want to try? Oh, you, I'm going to let you go first. I will do that. OK. Ah, you're going to get sharpened, huh? Yes, my first time. <laughs> oh, Keep going. Uh -huh. I'm ready. You're taking no prisoners. 
<laughs> no pressure. <laughs> you want to try? Sure. Okay. Wow. Oh. This is hard. Yes. Okay, good. Fine. Fine. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. It looked like the president and I had already done the hardest part, so we decided to leave the rest to Ismael. He sliced away leaves until he reached the agave's heart, the piña, or pineapple. ¿Cómo cuánto produce de tequila? Poquito, ¿ah? ¿eh? Esto produce, son siete kilos para un litro de tequila. Like 10 liters? From 11, 12 From one. liters. Let's drink. Well done. We did it. We did it. Back in town, we were joined by the distillery's owner, Don Juan Beckman. Look at that, he puts it on his head. There, we picked up the trail of our piña and watched as the workers dropped them in to giant ovens. Huh? It's, yeah. it's easier to, to be president. <laughs> All right. Then, it was on to bottling. Okay, and I'm gonna put it back in. The president explained that this is handmade tequila. All the bottles are filled, one by one, by human hands. There we go. Now what do we do? In this case, ours. Okay. All right. Down here. And after a different kind of presidential seal. Ah! The official seal of success. We did okay. Official. With the finishing touch, now I had the complete tequila experience. Well, almost. Can I have some now? Not no. now. <laughs> Before you taste tequila, yes. you must to listen a Mexican song. Okay. This would have been a great end to our visit, but it still felt somehow incomplete. We cut the agave, we picked up the pinot, we threw it in the oven, we bottled it. Can I drink it now? No. No, no, Jets. First we have to eat. Oh, we, oh, and we uh, have to prepare the meals. So. They led me over to a table where Jesus Avila, the head chef of the Intercontinental Hotel in Guadalajara, was waiting. So, Mr. President and Jesus, what are we making today? We are going to prepare some mix of uh, traditional Mexican food and new Mexican food. The name of the dish? Guachimantones, ceviche style. Yes, what is that? Look at that. Guachimantones are pyramid of the region. Uh -huh. Take these because okay, you need to do exactly the same here. <laughs> <laughs> we began to prepare the dish using fresh local ingredients. Okay. We have shrimp and lobster. Carrots, yes. yes. Okay. Red onion, uh, mix. Local mix. is the key. Chef Avila bought the shrimp, lobster, and scallops from the Mexican Caribbean. Take oh, 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 look, look at that. that. Pyramid, watch him on Oh, this is bread? Yes. yes. And because we are in tequila, of course, we serve it with blue agave chips. Would you let me work at your hotel now? Yeah. Oh, don't lie to me. You can wash dishes in the hotel. <laughs> but before that, can I finally drink some tequila? Salud. Salud. Yes. Salud. 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 Peter, the royal tour is almost over, but there is one more thing that I don't want you to miss. And I promise we will travel there in style. Isn't this amazing? What an incredible view. If you think that's amazing, they can look over this way. Wow. over the ancient city of Teotihuacan, and this is the Pyramid of the Sun. 
This city took almost 150 years to build and by 500 AD covered over eight square miles with a population believed to be as high as 200,000. Like many of the Mayan cities, the reason for Teotihuacan's collapse largely remains a mystery. Today, Teotihuacan is one of 31 UNESCO World Heritage Sites in Mexico, the most in the Americas. It was a stunning view, but sadly, it also meant our adventure was nearing its end. It was hard to believe how much ground we'd covered and how much we'd experienced in just a week. We'd explored the ancient ruins and hidden treasures of the Maya, and we were invited into the mysterious world of their descendants. We'd witnessed some of nature's most incredible displays of beauty, and we'd adventured across some of Mexico's most inspiring terrain. And along the way, I not only learned an incredible amount about Mexico, but also about Mexico's president. Mr. President, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to show me your country in, in such a special way, but I got to get back home. Not so fast, Peter. You know what the real magic of ballooning is? You know where you take off, but you have no idea where you will land.